Hey everybody, it's Jen. It is a weird rainy Saturday in Sacramento. I have been not in a funky mood, but definitely not in a great mood today. Um, I'm really enjoying doing the daily podcast. It's called the Life Coach Pod. Feel free to drop in and check out that. It's kind of my it's it's my fantasy of being able to be a TV show host and running my own show. It's fun, but it's actually been a lot of work. For every show, I'm trying to do a a companion blog that has a little more information about what was talked about on the show. And then we're having guests. So I'm booking guests. So I'm working as a producer and a booker and a writer and a publicist and production because I have to edit them. But it gives me something to do every weekday, which I realized today I didn't have anything to do. I knew I wanted to um, do The Lawyer's Daughter for sure. And I want to keep going with these articles because I really want to get to the preliminary hearing that we had down in Ventura so we can talk about some of the evidence that came out there before we knew who really killed them. So I, I knew I needed to do this today, but honestly, I watched two movies. I watched Pet Cemetery, which was creepy and, I don't know, kind of delicious because I love Stephen King. And then I watched Palms with Diane Keaton, which it's only great for um, those of us over 50 because there's a lot about ailments, which I cannot stand when my friends talk about their ailments, but uh, God knows that's what people have as they start to age is the ailments but palms palm was good and or palms i guess it's palms I, that's streaming on xfinity if you're looking i didn't realize xfinity had so many um decent movies that they were letting us stream right now so good for us or, well actually no it's made me a total schlub today but i wanted to get back to these stories there's a couple other quick updates too just current events we have had the chief justice of the california courts i think that's her name I mean, I think that's her title. She has shut down all in-person court proceedings. So anything with a jury, which we won't have anytime soon, but anything that's having people come in, I have heard word that they're trying to figure out how to do some kind of broadcasting of court proceedings so that people are protected. And then there was another article about the uh, defend the um, public defender's office. Anybody who needs a defend a defense attorney, they're trying to figure out a way to do video conferencing for defense attorneys to be able to talk to people in the Sacramento County Jail. They're releasing a certain number of prisoners over there, which I think is actually good. People who have sixty days or less to go, who are in non nonviolent offenders, they're going to um, let them out because of the virus. That's actually good, and I think that works in our favor because we want to have as much. Uh, as little virus in that jail for D'Angelo as possible. I still worry about the ventilation systems and how air moves in a big institution like that. And of course, the guards, God love them for doing their jobs, but they're coming and going every day. So I do worry about D'Angelo getting the virus, but I can't worry about it very much. There's not a damn thing I can do about it. But those are some of the updates that have been happening as uh, we're following the breaking news in California. I have to say the good news is we're hearing that our shelter in place that the governor asked for now over a week ago seems to be, uh, what is that, lowering the curve, flattening the curve. So we're in good shape with regard to that as long as we all stay inside or stay at home and do what we're supposed to do and not cross-contaminate people. I think I think we might we might be okay here in California. I'm hoping, I'm hoping. I feel so bad for the other parts of the country and other parts of the world where this thing has really grabbed hold and and people are suffering. And if you're in that position right now or your loved one is sick, I I am so sorry. I know we're all thinking of you. I've never felt a stronger sense of community than I feel right now. So I just want you to, to know that and know we're all in this together, um, even though our experiences might be very different. Okay, so that that was kind of a downer, but I've been that's the kind of day I've had. So I'm back in the big murder book, and I'm now we're going to move forward in time. We just in the last episode we talked about the estate being sued, and then of course our lawsuit. A friend has done some preliminary research on the Maverick, uh, our estate being your dad's estate being sued, and the Maverick business. I need to go dig into that now because there are things I can go look at. She sent me a lot of great links. So I'm excited about that. And I'm going to dig into that at some point. In the meantime, we are now uh, at the end of a seven-month investigation. And the date for this story is October 12, 1980. So yeah, March to October, seven months later, 
Greg Zoria and Rita Beamish have written now the first of two parts on the Smith's Murder Police Closing In. That's the title. And so I will go through that. All this I'm doing a cold read like always. And so we're going to find things that... Um, that will be interesting, and I will take timeouts and explain some of the people and cast of characters if new characters are introduced here and who they were or what I can remember. It's amazing what I did and didn't know a long time ago. So, okay, here we go. We're going to dig in. This is part one of two. It's been seven months since 12-year-old Gary Smith opened the door on a grisly scene that was to become one of the most notorious and baffling murder cases in Ventura history. The boy who came to mow the lawn that Sunday morning, March 16th, walked into the hillside home of his father, attorney Lyman Smith and stepmother Charlene, to find the couple had been bludgeoned to death in their bed. Months of intensive police investigation into a labyrinth of business, personal, and social affiliations of the slain couple have turned up a morass of information, intrigue, and speculation. Huh. Interesting use of the word morass. Okay. Anyway, turned up a morass of information, intrigue, and speculation. (laughs) Feels like maybe that's what I should call my book one day. Intrigue and speculation. That's, That's me. Okay, keep going. One knowledgeable source has described the investigation as extremely thorough and complete. Consequently, investigators' efforts had led them to the identification of a suspect. A person authorities believe killed Mr. and Mrs. Smith, said a course a source close to the investigation. It has also been learned that through the twisting and turning course of the investigation, police temporarily identified another man, a business associate of Smith's, as a murder suspect. But attention has since got so many S's, guys. Sorry, I'm trying not to sound so S-y. Now you're going to hear it with me. But attention has since shifted from him. Although the man, shaken by the police attention, has already hired an attorney and begun preparing a defense. Still, there have been no arrests, and after six months of investigation, police chief, Ventura Police Chief Ray McLean characterized the homicide as the most frustrating with which he has ever been involved. The Starfleet Press, however, has learned that, that though activity on the case has slowed, investigators are only waiting for the test results of information gathered at the scene of the crime in order to proceed. Public interest in the Smith case continues to be high. That's typical any time a well-known personality in a community is the victim of a crime, said McLean. I rarely go a couple of days until I run into somebody who wants to know how the Smith case is going, said Ventura Police Captain Paul Leidick, head of the investigation. The fact that Smith, 43, for many years a respected lawyer in the county, was expected to be appointed to the Superior Court bench within a few days of his death adds to the mystery's high visibility in the community. Despite previous information that the Smiths didn't know what hit them when they were mercilessly beaten to death with a fire log, the Star Free Press has learned otherwise. Okay, so here we go. It took seven months for us to start to learn what really happened. (sighs) Here we go. Police Police have learned that there was a muffled cry from the Smiths' residence sometime in the night they were killed but evidence at the scene indicated there was no struggle, so though one of the victims may have detected an attacker, both apparently were quickly knocked unconscious and died. The Smiths were at a high point in their lives, eager to get confirmation on the judgeship, excited about the big new house they were planning to build on property they owned in Santa Paula, pleased with Charlene's venture into interior decorating, pulling together at least outwardly their often shaky marriage. Oh my God, now I understand where all this interior decorating stuff came from. Oh, it was such a non-event for all of us. I mean, it was just an idea she had that she wanted to try. Um, And now as you're beginning to learn about my dad and Charlene, that they had their hands in everything. They were always trying things. Eh, I'm kind of like that myself. I do like to try a lot of stuff, but that, that was what was happening. And it's interesting. Yes, they were planning to build a new house, but we knew it wasn't, I'm sorry, I'm rolling my eyes because we knew that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. My dad just didn't seem to have the money. Now, of course, there's money we still got to go find from the Maverick deal that somehow was missing, but he didn't have overtly have money. I mean, we were still getting with my mom got really, really piddly a pittance when it came to spousal support and child support. I think what we were getting back then was $600 a month. That was $150 for each child and $150 for her. 
that's all my dad. Now you got to go put that back on time. But honestly, it was nothing. And in fact, after recording the um, last episode, I talked to my mom a little bit about the money and she had hired, I guess, a really good attorney for the divorce. And my dad somehow convinced her to not hire him, her to not keep him. And mom has always regretted that, but she st- she, the, the deal was if she didn't hire the good attorney, there was still a chance they might get back together. Of course, that wasn't true. There was no chance they were going to get back together. And I keep going, mom, why was that even something you were interested in? But she was pretty, um, she was treated pretty badly by my dad in terms of how much he ran the house and didn't let her uh, make decisions or have any power. So I can see how, as a woman who was in that kind of relationship, it would have been easy to go ahead and just believe the man that you had trusted since you graduated high school, that he was actually maybe still looking out in your best interest. Now she believes that he potentially did have money hidden somewhere and he was terrified she would find it when, what, if this other attorney had worked with a forensic accountant and looked into his books. Either way, it's important to me for you to know that we three kids and my mom lived pretty poor and my dad lived fine. I don't know that I would say he lived wealthy, but he didn't ever hold back. He managed to make trips, obviously investments. He had membership at the country club. He had uh, he had a lease car from a business partner or a client of his gave him, he and Charlene lease cars all the time. So those things were taken care of, but I, I just didn't understand my dad's financial situation at all, other than the dichotomy between how he wanted to be perceived and what we were really living on and doing to survive. My mom was a wizard at making sure that everything was always equally, there were always equal amount. That we, the joke is we'd come out in the morning and there would be three glasses of juice, all exactly four ounces, like exactly. And that was all the juice we got. If you wanted more juice, you didn't get more juice. That was like a special treat in the morning that we had to take with our vitamin, which was a fluoride pill, I think. But um, that was how, it, like my mom was really good about making things stretch, about getting the most out of any, any most value out of anything she could. Okay, so sorry, went on a real tangent there, but that is um, just interesting because in this, the, we were just on the paragraph that said that the Smiths were, I love that he used the word high point since that was the name of their street. The Smiths were at a high point in their lives, eager to get confirmation on the judgeship, excited about the big new house they were planning to build on property they owned in Santa Paula, pleased with Charlene's venture into interior decorating and pulling together at least outwardly their often shaky marriage. Anyway, we'll get back to the Smiths were at a high point in their lives, eager to get confirmation of the judgeship, excited about the big new house they were planning to build on the property they owned in Santa Paula, pleased with Charlene's venture into interior decorating, pulling together at least outwardly their often shaky marriage. They were both highly energetic and were said to be climbing for new dimensions in their lives. Mrs. Smith, at 33, fashionable, intense, effusive, was beginning two business ventures, one in selling gold jewelry, the other in interior decorating. Smith, the steady, accomplished attorney with a passion for golf and Mexican food, had hopes of joining the county's judicial ranks, some of whose members he counted among his closest friends. The day before his murder, Smith had lunch with his friend and partner, Robert Placencia of Santa Paula, with whom he had recently started a new land development business. Smith had just learned he was among three or four finalists for the two open judgeships, said Placencia. He was really bubbling with enthusiasm. He figured he had it in the bag, Placencia said. This was one of his biggest dreams. Mrs. Smith's friends, Claire Lewis, who lives with her husband, Superior Court Judge Marvin Lewis, up the street from the Smith's residence, said Mrs. Smith was equally happy that week. The day of the murder, Thursday, March 13, they had lunch with Mrs. Smith, and she was the happiest I've seen her. She was the happiest I've seen her, Miss Lewis said. The last person to talk to the Smiths was Isabel Doyle of Oxnard, the mother of Mrs. Smith's former husband, Mike Doyle. She called around 7 p.m. Sorry, let me do that again. She called around 7 p.m. Thursday to visit with Mrs. Smith and during the conversation asked if there'd been any word yet on the pending judge decision. Charlene said, no, that Governor Brown, he'll take forever, Ms. Doyle, Mrs. Doyle recalled. This is, I just, sorry, my, my brain, I'm sorry for the lapse there. I was thinking, um, Mrs. Doyle, Mike's mom, was lovely, uh, was, is, I don't know if she's still with us, is a lovely person. And Charlene stayed close to her long after, obviously, long after her marriage dissolved with Mike. And I always thought that was such a wonderful thing that um, 
Isabel kept in touch with Charlene and essentially acted like a mom because Charlene really didn't have a mom. And so it was really, I just always remember thinking that's really cool that she stayed in touch with Charlene and didn't drop her just because Charlene basically bailed on her son. So, uh, sorry, my, that's where my brain went for that minute. Okay. The next two days were filled with the couple's absence, Smith failing to show up for an appointment Friday and his unheard of absence from the Santa Coy golf course on Saturday and their failure to meet friends in Santa Paula Saturday. But their friends gave it little thought until the bodies were found Sunday. It was a sunny weekend morning when young Gary Smith arrived at his father's high point drive home where two gardeners were already work landscape at work landscaping the yard, unaware anything was amiss. Gary heard the alarm clock ringing in the house. Puzzled, he ventured into the master bedroom where he found his father, Mrs. Smith, lying face down on blood-soaked sheets. Now, I don't think Charlene was face down, but again, this is still right now in October of 1980, so we'll get there. An autopsy revealed they were both killed by blows to their heads sometime Thursday night. Why a murderer came to the Smith's promising world continues to baffle both their friends and authorities. Those who knew the Smiths were puzzled not only by the possible motive, but by several enigmatic details of the murder itself. Their friend knew that Charlene Smith kept their their friends knew that Charlene Smith kept their spacious home spotlessly clean at all times. Why then would the dishes be left undone in the sink, the cushions on the couch be strewn, and the beds in the spare bedroom be ruffled while there was no sign of ransacking? Huh. Okay, there we go. There there's a little more that I'd forgotten about. So I knew I washed those dishes. I don't remember them being in the sink, honestly. I think I, I seem to remember them being on the counter. But, you know, I don't even know. Maybe somebody moved them. Who knows? I'm sure there's photographs, so I'm the one that could be wrong. Mrs. Doyle's daughter, Maureen, 22 of Oxnard, a close friend of, of Charlene and one of those mentioned in the murder, murdered woman's will, went to the house a few days after the murder when police reportedly had disturbed nothing other than to remove the bodies and the bed and part of the blood splattered wall. What she saw seemed incongruous with what she described Mrs. Smith's immaculate, everything in its place housekeeping. In addition to the cushions on the couch being askew, not thrown around, but just out of place, it looked like a lunatic went crazy and ran across the bed in the spare bedroom, she said. The Smiths were known to be scrupulous about keeping the doors locked, yet police said the home showed no signs of forced entry by the murderer. An autopsy revealed the couple were killed by blows to the head with a fire log, which was found lying on the bed between the two. A strange twist was that the couple's hands and feet had been bound while the autopsy indicated they were probably already dead when the killer tied them up. Yeah, eh, see, that just doesn't make sense to me. But I think we're going to find out later that this is sketchy. I mean, we have to find out later this is sketchy. And again, we're in 1980. The work being done is good. It's just not what we're used to now. And of course, any of us who watch crime shows and things um, probably even think it should be better than that. But that's a little bit of Hollywood magic. Okay, so let's keep going because there's two parts to this thing and we're only partway through part one. Police said that robbery was not a motive, but Mrs. Smith's personal jewelry, at least 20 rings, necklaces, earrings, and bracelets she wore daily and always left on her bathroom counter at night were missing. There were several thousand dollars worth of jewelry gone. Okay, that would make sense. Um, that would make perfect sense because, as I said, Charlene would always take off her jewelry, wash her face. Uh, do That was like a routine I'd seen her do several times. Um, so I didn't remember that her jewelry was stolen, but it was too easy not to steal, honestly. And a lot of it was um, pure gold. I, the jewelry that I had that she had given me was pure gold and it unfortunately got stolen decades later at my condo in Santa Cruz, but it was beautiful and it wasn't, it was, you could melt it down. So it had value, but they were also, most of the things that she was wearing were intended to be place settings where you, um, you know, the rings that you get before you put the stones in them. So you'd buy the shape of the ring and you'd buy it. They were beautiful without stones in them. They were truly beautiful. And they were, um, they, but they were pure gold as well, or, you know, 24 karat gold. So They were lovely, and I could see somebody taking them very easily. Okay, so go back to this. Yet her husband's jewelry and the $100 worth of gold jewelry Mrs. Smith kept in the house for her business were not taken. In the absence of robbery as a motive, officials were left only with a few other possibilities. Either the assailant knew Mrs. Smith well enough to recognize her favorite jewelry and took it for some personal reason, or the killer was faking a robbery and to do so grabbed whatever jewelry was readily accessible. 
Okay, this is Criminal Minds uh, Preschool Edition. A myriad of would-be clues found among the couple's wide-reaching contacts have failed to produce what McLean called a convincing evidence in the case. Very early on, there were all kinds of names popping up, McLean said. Everybody has a theory. There have just been a tremendous number of players. A guy like Lyman, he's probably touched in one way or another thousands of people in his community, said Smith's longtime friend and law partner, Phil Drescher. He ticked off some of Smith's past and present affiliations. His work as a prosecutor in the district attorney's office, then as a private lawyer. His participation in local elections, including chairmanship of the County Democratic Central Committee, the Santa Paula Rotary Club, the Santa Paula Boys Club, and the school board. His appointment to the state new motor vehicle board and his promising judge candidacy. His business ventures in land development and international shipping. Okay, I totally take after my dad. I would have, I absolutely have been known to have that many irons in the fire. (sighs) His involvement in Maverick International Airlines, a transport airline he helped form to fly cattle to Iran and the Middle East, had loomed as a possible key to the murders. That venture made for an intriguing episode of his life that continued to be played out after Smith's death. But it was Mrs. Smith's personal life that caught police attention early in the investigation. A man with whom she had reported to have had an extramarital affair was checked out as a suspect during the first days of the investigation. I've always loved that extramarital affair. Like, affair needed that whole big word in front of it to just say what it is. You had an affair, okay? Extramarital, whatever. It's descriptive. Dozens of phone calls from the tipsters named him as someone the police should investigate. Considering the number of years Mrs. Smith reportedly knew the man and the obvious motive of jealousy if the Smiths were really resolving any marital problems, a source confided that one couldn't ask for a better suspect. But he reportedly passed a polygraph test. (laughs) Didn't we all? Oh, did I just say that out loud? Okay, keep going, Jen. An investigator was quoted by one friend of Mrs. Smith's as saying police were 98% sure the man was not her killer. 98 Mrs. Smith was described as outwardly ebullient, a person who consumed a room with her lively presence. Okay, it's so terrible. I can't believe I'm laughing. I'm a horrible person because it's actually true. That is actually true. The thing is, what we knew, what we kids knew, is that Charlene was generally always screaming at us all the time. She was like a banshee. She was not in any way, and I don't mean this bad, she was not in any way prepared to have three halfway grown children to deal with in a house. And we were all smart, sassy, and way over empowered. And she didn't stand a chance. And I just remember her always screaming. Oh, actually, I actually remember coming in once when she was um, cleaning as well. She did clean the house, not wearing clothes. So that was a surprise. That was a different time. Uh, and I, I think I just learned about things that I just didn't know living with my mom and dad. I'm like, oh, this is a thing people do. Did not know one might clean naked. I actually don't mind cleaning naked occasionally myself, but I typically don't have other people in the house. Just just my cats and and well, they already know I'm weird. Okay, let's go back. Sorry, I'm going to go back to this praise of Charlene because, but because it, it's it's not. I I she did, she was very charismatic. She absolutely was, and when she was smiling and when she was on, she was delightful. So here we go. Mrs. Smith was described as outwardly ebullient, a person who consumed a room with her lively presence, but several friends said she was inwardly dissatisfied and unhappy. She was known to have a demanding and contentious side as well, with a shrill voice that could express displeasure as well as delight. Oh, had I only kept reading. Yes, there we go. That's my stepmom. Most of the friends knew that the couple had a rocky marriage, that they had separated for a time. For more than a year, they had visited Westlake Village Marriage Counselor. And their arguments had been sometimes so intense that a few who a few who knew them assumed when they first received word of the couple's death that they were killed they had killed one another, <laughs> including their, their daughter. Because I totally thought that had happened. Some folks were aware Mrs. Smith was to have reported I'm sorry, let me get this right. Some friends were aware Mrs. Smith was reported to have had an extramarital affair. Most who did not hear of it until after her death said knowing Mrs. Smith's vivaciousness and intense personality, they were not surprised. She was a person who could live life on many levels, said one longtime friend, and in some ways she seemed to live in more than one world. I'm just going to do now another commercial for my poor stepmom because I've learned since that, I mean, I knew this then. I knew Charlene never really got 
filled up. You know that feeling we have when we know we're loved and we really don't need anything else because we're good and we know who we are. Charlene never had that sense of identity. I think losing both of her parents at a really young age, um, she just never, ever felt felt love. She just couldn't feel it. So she was constantly, constantly searching for it. It just wasn't something she could feel. So I understand her desperation and constantly trying to find, see if she could attract more men and attract more men. Somehow that was a way she could feel like she had, she was, in, she was special, that she was worth being loved. So we're going to continue on because I don't know where this is going to go, but I just wanted to share that part with you because it's actually really sad. Okay. Before she married Smith, she had told several friends she was working as an airline stewardess and had sent cards from Lake Tahoe, Alaska, and Hawaii to Maureen Doyle. Some friends never thought to doubt her. Others thought she was making it up to cover her activities with Smith before their marriage. And still other friends never heard of her mention it at all. Okay, we do know that she was in Lake Tahoe often with my dad because my dad stayed at his stepmother's cabin there. Um, and it likely was, I don't know all the dates, um, but it likely was before my dad was divorced from my mom because that was one of the things they were doing. And I do know my dad also went to Alaska. So it's highly likely they also went to Hawaii because my dad would do anything to delight Charlene and to woo her. That was his MO. He was really good at that. So I can absolutely imagine uh, her cover story being that she was an airline attendant. I'd never heard, I don't, I mean, I read this in 1980 and I knew that wasn't true then. So yeah, there we go. Attractive and enthusiastic, Charlene Smith was prone to highly charged emotions. Carolee Loveless of Las Gatas, Mrs. Smith's childhood friend and her maid of honor when she married Smith, called her friend's life very tragic. Charlene Smith had never known an immediate family. Several of her friends said she had only told them that they were her only family. She missed not having a family. It was very drawn to families, any family, said Jill Karen Morell, a childhood friend. Mrs. Smith had no children of her own, but she doted on the children of her friends, lavishing them with gifts. Charlene was the only child of Winslow Herz Herzenberg. Okay, all of you people Googling Winslow Herzenberg, who was killed in a car crash when she was three, and a mother who left her father when Charlene was a baby. She was raised by her grandmother, Gladys Herzenberg, in Camarillo with the help of Marjorie Smith, now a Ventura resident, not my mom. Yeah, here we go. Who coincidentally bears the same name as Lyon, Lyman Smith's first wife. Charlene's Marjorie had been engaged to Charlene's father at the time of his death and remained close to Charlene, spending the afternoon with her the day before she was killed. One of the most difficult times in Charlene's life was the 1977 death of her grandmother, her last co close rel relative. Charlene's Marjorie Smith said. Charlene had two unsuccessful marriages, the first shortly after her graduation from Camarillo High School, who was to Guy Clements, with whom she moved to Florida, where he was stationed with the Air Force. It was a, a short-lived marriage about which she rarely, if ever, spoke. It's so interesting because I want to get um, Charlene's cousin on to talk about this, but I believe this is the man with whom she skated. Charlene was an incredible skater, not ice skater, not, um, you know, roller skater. Sorry, I can't think of the word, roller skater. She was like a, a, a champion, competitive roller skater, and Guy was her partner. So then they ended up getting married and moving to Florida. Didn't last very long. Yeah, she did come home. And here I'll go on with the article. In 1969, she married Mike Doyle, a sheriff's deputy, but a few years after that marriage, two dissolved. For several years before the Smith's 1975 marriage, Mrs. Smith had worked as a secretary in her future husband's law firm, then until several months before her death as a judicial secretary for the municipal courts. A perfectionist, she could be demanding on the time and energies of others, including her husband. Even in the most important meetings in the last days of Maverick Airlines, Charlene would rig seven, eight, nine times a day, and he, Smith, would interrupt the most detailed meetings to go and explain to her what was going on, said business associate William Bartfield. Mrs. Smith had filed for divorce in 1978, but the couple, couple apparently decided to try to patch things up before more than the initial paperwork was done. Many of their friends felt the Smiths, toward the end of their lives, seemed to have quelled the volatile side of their marriage. Neighbors who had heard their yelling fights said those shouting matches had seized in the few months before their deaths. Two days before their murder, the Smiths had dinner with Placencia and his wife Helen and had talked excitedly about the home Placencia was designing for the Smiths on the hill just above one of his family, just above the one his family was moving into the following weekend. So, by the way, we knew, the, we knew Bob Placencia and his kids 
um, his, one of his stepkids was actually uh, friends with me. So I knew about him from the back door too. And yes, this home was a big talk, a big, big talk of the home. In fact, it terrorized, my, my dad terrorized my mom with it because he said he was going to take the boys to come live with him after he got this home built, which just, those are the kind of things my dad would unfortunately poke a stick at my mom and keep her on her toes. But that was, um, I didn't really realize that they were that close to divorce. I had been called up to break up fights before. Especially I was I was old enough to drive and I talk about it, I think, on a blog post and I'll talk about it more, I think, going forward for the podcast. But yeah, they had hella fights. I mean, really good fights, really loud, lots of yelling, some physicality. I wouldn't say my dad was a wife beater. It was Charlene was more likely to take a chunk out of my dad. Um, my dad knew not to hit. He would use his words and he would use his anger, but he didn't hit. Um so really interesting. All right, let's go back. He, let's see. Uh, they were supposed to help us move. That's okay. We're talking. This is about Placencia still, still speaking. They were supposed to help us move. I don't like to think about that. Placencia said, "I lost a super good friend and a hell of a partner." He said of Smith. He described Smith as a solid, forward-looking partner, the kind of guy you could lean on rather than him leaning on you. Although also intense and outgoing, Smith was even in temperament, as his wife was volatile. He was described as an aggressive but calm and persuasive attorney. I can't recall a specific occasion where he really lost his temper, said Judge Stephen Stone, Smith's friend and former law partner. He was gregarious, but in a way that was not flamboyant. He was not shy at all, but reserved in terms of his motions, said Stone. Stone just said his friend was proud of coming from humble beginnings, the son of a railroad laborer now retired and living in Sacramento. Smith had conscientiously pursued a certain respected social and professional status in the community. He enjoyed the company of people who made things happen, Stone said. Superior Court Judge William Peck, oh, Uncle Bill, who attended law school who attended law school at Bolt Hall, Berkeley with Smith, described Smith as politically ambitious. For a time he had considered running for a state assembly seat, others had said. Peck subsequently appointed to one of the two judge seats seats for which Smith was being considered, said he spoke to Smith Tuesday, uh, the Thursday he died, about going to Los Angeles for the judgeship interviews. Similarly, the last conversations most of the Smith friends had with him were about the pending appointment, and several of his judge friends were confident he, he would win it. It would have been the pinnacle of his already successful ca- career and the fulfillment of a dream. Smith arrived in the county in 1961, one of the promising crop of attorneys in the district attorney's office. God, it feels like this needs music behind it. Then in 1963, he joined what would, be, what would then be the firm of Speech and Stone. He de- developed a general practice handling criminal defense as well as probate, business clients, and other civil matters, said his partner Phil Drescher. Phil and his first wife, Marjorie, had three children in their 17-year marriage, Gary the youngest and Jay 15 and Jenny 18. The children live in Ventura with their mother. Involved in many community activities over the years, Smith seemed committed to none of them on a long-term basis, instead devoting his energies to each interest for a period of time, then moving on to something else. As time went on, he didn't have the time for everything, and his interest turned more and more to financial ventures, said Stone. He had reached the point where there were two things, goals, he had left in his life, said Smith's close friend and neighbor Judge Lewis. Those goals were attaining a judgeship and investing as a means of acquiring wealth and power, Lewis said. With an optimistic eye toward the judgeship appointment, Smith had begun to divest himself of some of the business entanglements in the months before his death, friends said. But his many business affiliations in the last years of life provided a maze of investigative trails for authorities to comb in their murder investigation. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so that is part one. And we're actually probably at a good place to, to pause and I'll make the next podcast part two. Um, what was I going to, I was going to mention something though about this that I was reminded about dad. Oh, dad was on the school board. So yes, as they described my dad, he absolutely was the person who got involved with projects for a while. I have to say, I sometimes do that myself. Uh, he would get fired up. He was good. He was a good motivator and a, a kind of the kind of person you want to help you get started. He just would get bored. I think he would be on to the next thing. And so there's a funny story, though. He was on the school board, and that was in Santa Paula School District at that time. And we and the kids, Jay and I, Gary, oh, all three of us, actually, now that I remember back, all three of us, he had put us all in this experimental school. 
It was called the Portal School. It was a nightmare. I mean, God loves somebody for trying to change education, but we all were pulled out of this, uh, the public schools, and we were put in this experimental school, which was kind of a joke, and I don't know how any of us learned. It made it hard for all three of us when we finally moved to Ventura, which is where we went after Portal. Uh, we went to Ventura, and their kids had been in school learning real stuff, and we had been at floofy school for two years and had been very loose and thank god we were just smart enough to adapt but as mom said it was the worst year of her life trying to get all three of us back into a regular intellectual rigor that was required for school after we'd been at portal school okay so just those last story and then i'll wrap this up for today and we'll come back with part two for, t- for tomorrow um at portal so we, my dad's on the school board apparently i had made my award-winning, oh yes, they were award-winning peanut butter cookies that I had entered into the Ventura County Fair. They had won a third place, which I have to say, for me, was not too shabby. Because you don't have any idea how many cookies are entered into the fair? Um, me either. But let's just say third place was amazing. So I had made my award-winning cookies for my dad to take to the school board meeting. And instead of making them there, my dad's partner, Steve Stone, ate them all. They were in the office because dad would go from the office to the school board meeting on school board nights and Steve ate them all. The thing that I can, the reason I know this story and the thing that I think is so hilarious, and this is how you know, really grew up in a small town, is that story. My dad then told that story at the school board meeting and that story made the paper. So there I was, uh, Santa Paula Chronicle famous for making my cookies that his law partner, who, by the way, I love Steve Stone. He, he did know us the whole time as we grew up and he was, he's just the sweetest man ever, but I guess he uh, likes peanut butter cookies. So that's a wrap for today. We'll be back tomorrow. I, we, I'll be back tomorrow and we'll get through the story and learn more things. Cause I think we're going to really dive into the business side of things as Greg and Rita's story continues in part two. If you're still listening and want to know what happened and you heard that weird jump in the middle, here's what happened next. Kitty, oh my goodness. Kitty, no. Kitty, no. Yep, Kitty was trying to knock over a whole vase of flowers. (laughs) Had to stop and jump across the room. Okay, talk to you next time.